Over the past few years, for me, John Cassavetes went from being that guy who played the husband in Rosemary's Baby to being one of my all-time favorite, not actors, but filmmakers. My time spent digging into the filmography of John Cassavetes has been one of my most rewarding deep dives into any individual's body of work, and I hope I can encourage some others to take the same plunge. It's not every day you discover someone who single-handedly changes the way you look at the crafts of acting, writing, and directing actors, but Cassavetes holds that power. There are plenty of cinephiles who know and respect Cassavetes' work, but for his influence and his innovations to the craft, he deserves to be counted amongst the greatest and most important filmmakers of all time, but he rarely is. In his lifetime, and still to this day, the full breadth of his contributions to the medium of filmmaking have never been properly lionized by the general public. But maybe that's okay. Cassavetes wasn't making his films for them. I think we're going for a way of saying something that might be different than uh, the normal, conventional, boring way of saying something that most people like in an audience because they are uh, uh, they are dull in their own lives. My God. It's uh, true. It's true. Oh, Nobody's uh, going to go to the picture. So what? <laughs> Let them not go. As an actor working in films made by others, Cassavetes found a great deal of success. But when it came to his own directorial efforts, his career was full of constant hardships, scraping and scrounging to get his films made and out into the world. The average mainstream moviegoer may have never seen a single one of the roughly 11 feature films he directed, but cinema would not be what it is today without his groundbreaking and game-changing contributions to the art form. It's no exaggeration to say that every director working today owes an eternal debt of gratitude to John Cassavetes for paving the way and yet he rarely gets the full credit that he deserves. Cassavetes entered the industry as an actor in the early 1950s, mostly appearing in bit parts and guest star roles on television shows. By the end of the decade, he was teaching his own acting style, a direct rebuke to the popular method acting style, which at the time was surging in popularity, thanks in no small part to the game-changing early performances of Marlon Brando. Seven, eight years ago, you have had your hair uh... Great. Looks like a hunk of rope. You have wires on your teeth and glasses, everything. It was really a mess. Cassavetes set out to prove that method acting wasn't all it was cracked up to be, and that better performances could be achieved through less disruptive and less self-aggrandizing means. And for my money, he'd succeeded in that goal several times over. Through his films and his own performances, Cassavetes threaded the needle on that same shift away from the stuffy, rigid acting style that was the norm in Hollywood for so many years, seamlessly developing and perfecting a far more natural, nuanced performance style, and leading the charge on that shift before most of the old guard in the industry were ready to accept it. Also before the end of the decade, Cassavetes hopped into the director's chair for the first time with 1958's Shadows. Mm -hmm. Value. Really, if I'd known this was the first time for you, I wouldn't have touched you. I didn't know it could be so awful. This is where a knowledge of film history becomes vital to truly appreciating the work of John Cassavetes. Shadows was produced independently, and if you don't know right off the bat why that detail is so important, it's because independent filmmaking wasn't yet a thing in 1958. I think John uh, is, Shadows was the first really independent American film. I think it's the independent film, what is called independent film, begins with John. In the middle of the Hayes Code era, and in the midst of the death grip over filmmaking held by the studio system, Cassavetes disregarded all of the accepted truths about how the film industry worked and blazed his own trail. With a low budget that he raised himself, Cassavetes created what was essentially the first independent film in the history of American cinema, simple silent projects from the pre-code era notwithstanding. Shadows is quite a rough film. It's pretty messy, and it might be the type of film to respect, admire, and appreciate more than actively enjoy. In some ways, it feels like a prototype for what Cassavetes would go on to accomplish later in his career. But that's not to say that there isn't anything worthwhile in its content or substance, because there definitely is. 
You need to accept its wandering narrative, be on board for some rough visuals and audio quality, and you have to overlook the regrettable choice to cast a couple of white actors as a pair of black siblings. There are two things to note in Cassavetti's defense there, alongside any different times arguments. The first is that so-called interracial sex was literally outlawed by the Hayes Code at the time. And since the film's plot revolves around an interracial romance, Cassavetes would have been legally unable to make the film at all and faced even more pushback than he already did had he cast it differently. And the second is that Cassavetes did at least cast real black actors in other major roles with well-drawn characters in a time where that was exceedingly rare. Largely improvised and with a grungy visual aesthetic, Shadows looks and feels unlike any film that came before it. From a modern vantage point, it can be difficult to keep in perspective just how radical and subversive this film was. It's important to remember that in the same year Shadows came out... Benny, come on, let's call a couple of chicks. Why not? Go no, home, oh, Benny, come on. Come on, Ben. Come on, what do you know, Ben? You should know a lot of chicks. Yeah, come on. You said you had something, man. You've been bragging all day about yeah. it. Ben, call Barbara, Barbara Kennedy. Cinema still looked and sounded like this across the board. Articles of clothing, half-smoked reefers, Needle marks. Something else could produce the same effects. Demerol, for instance, or sodium pentothal. You could smell this stuff on it. Did you tell Butch and his gang to take a taxi as a matter of life and death? Good. Stay on this wire. Butch is on his way over. All we gotta do is hold out for 15 minutes. The boys will be back to the coming in here to phone. I'll handle him. Mr. Page is a great educator, and he runs a school down in the village where they do all sorts of advanced things. Or oh, Acacius, do you think you might find room for Patrick? For him, yes. Ah. Just listen to how different the dialogue and performance styles are in Shadows versus just about every other film that came out at the same time and earlier. Look, bro, we'll have lunch tomorrow, okay? After lunch, after lunch, we'll go to a, a, a movie or something like that and maybe have some drinks. Look, I don't, want, I don't want to fight with you. I don't want to argue with you. What's the matter? I want you to go. What? I, I don't want you. I don't want you. I don't want you to, to, to hurt my sister. We often look back to the French New Wave when pinpointing the major shifts in filmmaking, and it's key to note that Shadows precedes Godard's Breathless by two years and came out the same year as Le Beau Sarge, which is typically considered to be the first official film of the French New Wave. Shadows was cutting edge to a fault. In fact, it was too far ahead of its times. People weren't ready for it. Or rather, the established workings of the film industry weren't ready for it. The general populace didn't really get the chance to experience it. Despite his best efforts, Cassavetes was unable to secure any sort of real distribution for Shadows. It was too different and bold, and also too rough around the edges. Its shot at success in the US was snuffed out before the film even had a chance to connect with people. The film did eventually land distribution in the European market, since they were far more hip to what Cassavetes was throwing down over there. But that didn't do too much to help Cassavetes' ongoing struggle to get films made in the States. A full decade would end up going by before he managed to make his next film, in his own voice, by his own rules, without restrictions or guidelines, or stuffed shirts peering over his shoulders. I add all those qualifiers because Cassavetes did continue directing shortly after Shadows, but he wasn't allowed to be true to himself or his filmmaking sensibilities. Cassavetes directed the films Too Late Blues and A Child is Waiting in the early 60s, within the confines of the studio system and within the accepted boundaries of contemporary filmmaking, boundaries which he had ground to dust with his first film. He was in the director's chair for these two films, but it's kind of hard to tell. Every once in a while, you catch a glimpse of the real Cassavetes in each of these movies, but they largely feel like they could be the work of any number of directors working at the same time, which speaks to the homogenous nature of studio filmmaking. They lack his spirit, his flair, his commitment to authenticity, his exploration of human nature, and his perspective. They aren't bad films by any stretch. In fact, The Child is Waiting is actually quite good. They just don't feel like Cassavetes, and they play by all the rules he'd already spat in the face of and proven outdated. 
Two late blues and a child is waiting find Cassavetes forced back into coloring inside the lines. Whereas Shadows wasn't just Cassavetes coloring outside the lines, it was him coloring outside the whole goddamn coloring book. Passionately scribbling the future of cinema right onto the tabletop with little care for how it looks, only for what it means. With Two Late Blues and A Child is Waiting, Cassavetes proved that he was easily capable of delivering precisely what the studios and the mainstream public wanted. But that wasn't what he was interested in. He didn't want to play by their rules, because wouldn't cinema be so much more exciting if he did things his own way? Of course it would. That's why he said screw the system and went back to blazing his own trail with 1968's Faces. And from that point on, Cassavetes' films all embrace his signature style and point of view. The one minor exception is his late stage film Gloria, which is certainly more commercial and accessible than the rest of his output. But even Gloria still feels like a Cassavetes film in a way that Too Late Blues and A Child is Waiting simply don't. Every single one of Cassavetes' movies was a hard-fought battle to scrape by without compromising his intentions. For years, he was a lone operator working outside the studio system, and making his films often meant self-financing the projects out of his own pocket and with the contributions of his committed casts. Faces is where the Cassavetes stable of actors begins to really take form. Seymour Castle, Peter Falk, Ben Gazzara, and John Cassavetes himself frequently played the leading men of Cassavetes' films, while the leading lady role was almost always reserved for Cassavetes' real-life wife and muse, Jenna Rollins who was an instrumental part of Cassavetes' success. The two were a real force of nature and comprised one of the all-time great cinematic duos on and off screen. I have five points, Nick. I figured it out, and it's for me. One is love, two is friendship, and three is our comfort, and four is I'm a good mother, Nikki. I belong to you. That's it. Those are my five points. That's what I have. I have five points. One, five, five. This little acting troupe routinely turned in some of the best performances you will find in all of cinema. Cassavetes' films, more than anything else, put acting first. The plots are often meandering and simplistic, and there's hardly ever anything in the way of traditional excitement or catharsis. Instead, placing 100% emphasis on characters and the performances that drive them. <laughs> the world is composed, <laughs> comprised of, not, of, of a group of people that oh. uh, uh, have opinions <laughs> and, and, and lack emotion. <laughs> And we make pictures of emotion. I really like people, you see. I really like people. I don't like business or corporate structures or anything like that, but I do like people. Knowing just how tough each of these movies was to make, how often the budgets ran out, and how many times everything nearly fell apart, helps you appreciate the hard work and dedication put in by each of these actors who believed in Cassavetes' vision entirely and put their own necks on the line to get the films made. Cassavetes tended to use the money he earned as an actor in mainstream hits like Rosemary's Baby and The Dirty Dozen to self-finance his films. But when the money ran out, as it pretty much inevitably always did, this family of performers banded together to stave off disaster. Cassavetes and Jenna Rollins put up half the budget for a woman under the influence themselves, and Peter Falk kicked in the other half straight from his own pocket. In the first place, it wasn't for a studio. People say independent movies, and still someone has to put the money up. And when someone puts the money up, they always have something to say. So there isn't a total freedom. Um, we had an advantage in that we both had other careers. 
and we were both act so that when we ran out of money, which was just about all the time, <laughs> we would stop and go and do a, a movie for somebody else yeah. to bring the money. And so we were able make your move. To, yeah. to make our movies. And also, yeah. uh, in that when uh, uh, Peter and uh, his wife Alice put up half the money in Woman Under the Influence. So we worked totally freely. With the director and two stars of the film providing the entire budget, they gave themselves total freedom to make a work of art that was 100% truly independent, beholden to no opinions except their own aligned interests. I mean, the only, the only other person in American movies who used his own bread to make movies was Orson Welles. It was Orson and John. That was it. Until it still is today. Yeah. Amazing. Acting in movies, using the money to pay for the movies. It also helped that they never let ego get in the way. They were doing something special, but they never treated their films as precious. Half of the battle to, to make a, a good film in the United States, a free film, when I say good film, it's a free film. Whether it's good or bad, we don't know. But we'll put a year in for no money, for no anything, simply because there's a, an expression that has to be said. Now, we don't have any reverence for this expression. We don't believe it's a church. We have to have a good time, otherwise we die. <laughs> the sense of camaraderie between this troop of actors and friends is palpable and infectious, even though you never catch a glimpse of any of them, only their characters. You have to look outside the fictional realities to see the real them, and it sure is a treat to see the real them. When Cassavetes, Falk, and Gazzara all went on the Dick Cavett show together, it starts to feel like a chaotic scene from one of their movies, or a piece of bizarre performance art. You fellas have made a film. It's finished now, is it? You've done it all, and it's over? Is it? Would you like to nominate one who speaks? What is this? Are you guys gonna sit out here and clam up on my first 45-minute show? I think we know the answer to that. Well, who says that men's underwear is supposed to be white? Well, here's an opinion you from... Some, are you guys gonna... Match? I got now wait, it. now you guys aren't gonna put me on, are you? What do you want to match? What happened? I, I just started to lead into a jockey short commercial. The film is finished. The film is finished. Coward! Right. Coward! We weren't gonna talk to you for 45 minutes. He broke it. Like three drunk friends having a fun time at the establishment's expense. Now, but we will be right back after this message from uh, someone who doesn't, uh, that's the jockey short people. <laughs> it's genuinely one of the funniest talk show interviews I've ever seen, and it's just these three friends refusing to play ball with the mechanism designed to promote their own movie, Husbands. Hey, do you remember the time on my show that you and Norman Mailer got into a sort of set too, and the tension in the air was, you could cut it with a paring knife? No. no. <laughs> No, well, I, I thought he might remember that, but he doesn't. Now, uh, <laughs> married, right? Benny, Benny. And I, I don't want to look to see what's happening over there. Right? Ben. Has one of my guests not at all? Ben. The film is terrific. Come and see this film. It is the greatest film ever made in the history of the world. I promise you. Can we have a little dancing in the dark? Are we? Can we have a little dancing in don't the dark? Don't ask. You'll get it. You'll get it. All right, Benny. A Woman Under the Influence was the first of John Cassavetes' films that I personally saw, and it's no exaggeration to say that it significantly changed the way I look at cinema. Okay. No emotions, though. I really want to be calm. I really didn't. That's enough now. Are you tired or anything? You look great, Mom. I'm going to kiss your hand. Did you miss that? Bruce Springsteen once described hearing Bob Dylan's music for the first time as kicking open a door in his mind. And that's what seeing a Cassavetes film for the first time did to me. The two biggest defining character traits that set Cassavetes films leagues apart from all others are one, his commitment, to a remarkable sense of realism and a purity in characters and performances. And two, his outward hatred of artifice. 
Having a plot or even having a general story at play seemed like an inconvenience to Cassavetes. I think if you were in an ordinary movie, someone would say, pick up the dialogue, or let's go here, or this is what you should do, we need a little bizazz here and all that stuff, and that would be disastrous, I think, for a scene like that. So. Uh, when, when it gets out to a movie theater, somebody might say it's dull. Somebody else might say that's the most devastating scene I've ever seen. Somebody else might say, what was that all about? You, you know? A movie tries to pacify people by keeping it going for them so that it's sheer entertainment. Well, I hate entertainment. His films each have something real to say, and they have extremely layered and nuanced characters to say it. But a tightly plotted story was just something that would get in the way of the purity of those performances. Scenes go on and on, long after any other filmmaker would have cut to the next scene and the next plot point, frequently using long takes that just hold and hold and hold on the emotion at play. Faces is two hours, ten minutes long, and only consists of about five or six rambling scenes that each feel like interlocking, freeform, one-act plays. Plot, pacing, narrative momentum, structure, these things are of little to no concern to Cassavetes. They are the artifice he was pushing back against to find the truth. His stories only progress as the characters explore their way through situations, and what ends up forming the narrative backbone of one of his films is always a natural extension of the thoughts and feelings of those characters, rather than ever feeling like there's the hand of an auteur guiding those characters. This approach can make some of his films a bit difficult. Films like Faces and Husbands are undeniably challenging watches. They don't make it easy for you to appreciate all that they're doing. There are moments that will likely try your patience and be frustrating, but those same moments will eventually turn around and reward your patience with riches that far exceed expectations. One of the clearest examples of this odd type of ebb and flow can be found about an hour and a half into the two and a half hour runtime of Husbands. This hotel room scene plays out entirely in a single shot that lasts for over seven minutes. And that's not unusual for a Cassavetes film. A lot of talk and celebration is made of long takes in film. They're often flashy and attention-grabbing and impressive displays of coordination. But the way Cassavetes uses long takes is the antithesis of all of that. While plenty of directors use long takes to impress the viewer and draw attention, Cassavetes does the opposite. He isn't so much as deliberately crafting long takes as he is avoiding editing, because editing draws attention to the artifice. And by avoiding editing and letting these long takes unfold at whatever pace comes naturally, he provides his actors with a far larger canvas to paint their performances. You do a scene, and on one side of the thing, it's marvelous. And on the other side, it's marvelous. And you start cutting it up, and it's no longer marvelous. You miss it. Because you're either with that person's side or you're with this person's side. Now, that's the way I feel about it. Then it's cut. I say, I hate it, you know? What happened to Janet? What happened to the other actors? Uh, what happened? While the cinematic long takes that always get talked about stand out through all of the impressive spectacle that they're able to throw on screen, this long take excels through what is kept off screen. The bulk of this seven minute long take is spent watching Cassavetes place a room service order in painstaking detail watching him escort a woman to the bathroom, and watching the trio of titular husbands awkwardly mill around the hotel room in the uncomfortable energy between them and the trio of women they have just met and plan to have affairs with. A lot of this seems like nothing, frankly, but it's actually the one character who isn't on screen who has the most going on. That leg and torso in the foreground belong to Ben Gazzara, who spends the majority of this seven-minute take silent and with most of his body off camera. The brilliance of this long take arrives when, after multiple minutes of nothing much of note happening, the camera casually pans to the right to track another character's movement, and it is revealed that Gazara has been weeping silently and fighting to contain himself this whole time. And just as we casually glimpse this heavy emotional reveal, 
The camera just as casually pans away again, taking him back out of frame, until he becomes the focus moments later, though still facing completely away from camera. This level of restraint makes the emotion he's expressing hit so much harder, while also feeling so much more real and in the moment. Gazzara's performance wouldn't have the same lasting effect if it wasn't encased in the middle of this seven minute long take. Cassavetti's directing style was unlike any other filmmakers. He would often direct by refusing to direct. You know, he also didn't, uh, didn't always tell the actors what everybody was going to do in this scene. I only was in briefly in opening night at the end. <clears throat> and John just said to me, just go over to Jenna behind the curtain and tell her she was terrific in the show. That's all he told me. He didn't tell me that there's going to be an awful lot of other things going on. I am so drunk, I can hardly stand on these two feet. So I wouldn't have known. I will call you when I'm a little clearer. Peter? Yes. Uh, I'm going to say hello. Peter? You know Dorothy? My wife Dorothy? Peter Bogdanovich? Lady. Oh, lady. <laughs> it's a privilege. Uh, and then somebody comes over and says, excuse me, and interrupts me. I didn't know any of this was going to happen. John uh, Rome, Peter Park. Crazy. Because <laughs> <laughs> Peter Park wants to be directed. He wants specific direction. And John wouldn't give you a specific John would no, avoid it at all. He wouldn't tell you what to do. He wouldn't tell you where to sit. He wouldn't tell you where to go. But he set the environment for it to happen. Peter didn't like that. And so Peter would, would, would get him and say, look, John, now you tell me what to do. And then John would talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and talk. <laughs> and Peter would turn to me and say, do you know what this man is saying? <laughs> and I say, yeah, he wants you to go over there. He wants you to go over there, Peter. What if he wants me to go over there? Why doesn't he tell me to go over there? By creating the environment and trusting his actors to understand their characters completely, Cassavetes would leave it in their hands to figure out elements of the performance. This didn't mean that he just let them do whatever they wanted, quite the contrary. He would often do shots over and over and over again, sometimes without a clear reason that was perceptible to his actors, and while always avoiding giving any straight answers. I never understood a word he was saying when he was a director. Not one word. <laughs> and he did it deliberately. And the reason he did it was because he was afraid that if you understood what he said, you would translate it into a cliché. He did not trust words. He felt all words were an oversimplification. So that when you're talking about attitude, and you're talking about behavior, and you're talking about you know, an emotional energy, and you put them all together, and you try to reduce that to words, you inevitably end up with a oversimplification. So what would, how would he direct people in his he would keep film. talking so you were so confused that you didn't know what the hell was going <laughs> so it was like on double talk and that's no 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 he it was never that obvious he would grab he would get your attention you would believe he said oh no i got it but then boom, oh wait a minute wait that didn't fit with this and he would hold your attention when he got all done you say holy jesus and then he was saying action oh christ and you were off balance Deliberately, but that's good and sometimes. That's what he wanted. Right. He wanted you to be off balance. He didn't want you to impose your technique. Mm. He didn't want you to impose your ideas of what this should be fast, this should be slow, this should be loud, this should be softer, I'll take a pause, all that shit. <laughs> That was all shit to him. It could be extremely frustrating for the actors, but there was a certain purity to this process, and you couldn't deny those end results. A lot of people know what they're doing. <laughs> I don't know till the next day. You know, if, if our films are supposed to uh, be something like life is, some, you know, some vague, thing that life has maybe the films can contain then how can you determine what's going to happen tomorrow no. unless you have such a prescribed life that you're bored with it uh, we live an exciting life I mean, this is exciting stuff so i can't tell you what's going to happen tomorrow even if you can read it, you don't know how someone's going to interpret it. Cassavetes knew what he was looking for and knew that the actors would know it too, but only if they could stumble upon it for themselves. 
Anything less would stop being real and start being phony, manipulated, on rails, in the way that the studio films were. Not only did he not give direction, <laughs> because he said, I gave you the part. Don't ask me. You, as an actor, should know more about this character than anybody now in the world. It's for you to bring it to life. But the other thing was, he wouldn't let you talk to any other of the actors about about oh, their yeah. part or the, or oh, about yeah, the script yeah. at all. Oh, yeah. He wanted it just to happen on, and, you, and it did, because you didn't know what anybody was going to do. Maybe John's approach to filming, John's approach to acting was all so new. It was all so original. It was all so unfamiliar. Uh, and I was fighting it, you know, and I wanted to do what I was used to doing. Because during Husbands, I could kill her. You know, I, know. I, 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 wanted to, I wanted to kill her. I wanted to kill her. I didn't understand what Nally was doing. I didn't understand the picture. I didn't know what I was doing. By allowing his actors to interpret the characters and trusting them to figure out the truth of the piece, Cassavetes created a sense of freedom for his casts that was antithetical to studio filmmaking and his own experiences working as an actor for other directors. You know, I think John works, worked the way he worked with actors because that is the way he had wanted to be treated as an actor and was never. With perhaps the exception of someone like Elaine May, who was clearly playing by Cassavetti's rules when she directed him and Peter Falk in the excellent Mikey and Nicky. I call you and you never call me back. You don't call me. You haven't called me in months. Yeah, because after three months, you don't call me back. I don't call anymore. Now, you don't even say hello to me. I walk into that restaurant, and you're sitting there with Dave Resnick and Sid Fine, and I got to say hello to you three times because I'm too embarrassed to walk away without an answer. And when I walk away, I hear you say, Jesus Christ. Call that guy back. I forgot to give him the order. That was a joke. That joke was for Resnick. For you, not for Resnick. That's why I said it loud enough for you to hear it. That was, that was a joke for you. John Cassavetes passed away at the age of just 59 of cirrhosis of the liver after living much of his life as an alcoholic. When Cassavetes died, he left behind dozens of screenplays, most of which were left forever unmade. As many as 40 films never came to be because of his untimely death. His early passing was tragic for many reasons, not least of all because of the loving wife and children he left behind. Their loss was also a loss for cinema as a whole. Cassavetti seemed to somehow still be iterating upon and refining his process over the years. His final film, Love Streams, is one of his absolute best and feels 100% true to his unique voice while also feeling like a natural evolution of what came before, as he, for the first time, began to push his use of color and lighting in interesting, more stylized ways than he ever had before. And he began to take on a subjective point of view for certain scenes, rather than remaining purely objective at all times. These changes make Love Streams his best-looking film, without compromising in even the slightest way on everything he valued and prioritized in his previous work. It feels like a master artist still somehow managing to continue expanding his palette, but he sadly passed away not that long afterwards. He does technically have one more film credited to him as director after that, Big Trouble, but... That one doesn't really count. It wasn't his script, it wasn't a passion project, and it wasn't really a Cassavetes movie. He just took over for the original director, Andrew Bergman, partway through the shoot as a favor to his buddy, Peter Falk. These are the nine essential John Cassavetes films. Or if you want to only hit the top priorities, the purest Cassavetes films as they were, you can stick to these seven. Go watch all of them. Make sure you subscribe to Brickwell Pictures for more stuff like this. You can find a playlist of my other video essays right here on screen. And if you want some fiction to read, I recommend checking out my horror novel, South of the Mason-Dixon. There's a link down in the description where you can learn more about it. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.